Hello everyone, something shorter today about the artistical rebirth of the uh, late Middle Ages and especially in painting and this is what we're gonna um, scope uh, today and very much in synthesis because this is also very um, otherwise a very complex uh, topic that uh, I might... I have never been talking about history of art I believe on Schwerpunkt if not once uh, and I don't know how important it is, and this is. However, this is meant to be uh, mostly an introduction to the. Mm, I would say the, the Renaissance, um, you know, the Florentine Renaissance painting in the during the 15th century, and this is mostly meant to be uh, as an introduction, uh, not just to. Uh, chapter of history of art because that's too too much to say really but you know really trying to understand why this artistical rebirth started from from Florence and looking just at some of the <coughs> great names of of these um, characters um, so um, essentially in in the field of figurative arts, the humanistic uh, renewal was expressed um, essentially in the affirmation of this new way of conceiving the space. Mm -hmm. um, this was very important because throughout um, medieval art, you know, space um, also liked and uh, this depth had always been important, but uh, had Mm, you know, medieval art uh, up to that point had been relatively um, b bidimensional in some ways, or at least there had been a an advancement um, in perspective. Things think about uh, Giotto, for instance, in the 14th century. This kind of evolution thrown towards a more uh, what we call, in fact, sort of Renaissance art. It was so much focused on the uh, perfection of the proportions, on the depth uh, of the image of the multidimensionality of a word that naturally, especially in painting, is represented in always in a bidimensional way, but it's meant to, re uh, at this point, the object is meant to be represented also in its uh, full tri-dimensional tri um, uh, dimension. In fact. Um, and the center of this artistical rebirth into medieval Europe, uh, essentially at the beginning of the 15th century, was and you can you could argue couldn't be uh, uh, else than Florence, mm -hmm. um, and the reasons also here are perhaps the most important thing of all. You know, it's not that you know art developed itself from for no reason somewhere. Art is in many so many ways the uh, the direct representation, the consequence, the the epiphenomenal realization of a uh, civilization. In Florence, as we know, was the center of humanism. Uh, this point had been, and and why was it practically? Because um, there were so many other powerful centers in in Europe. Florence was at this point the seat of the uh, Florentine uh, lordship of the uh, Medici, but so essentially it wasn't much of a an enormous power. It was a an enormously wealthy mercantile republic. You're gonna call it in this way because essentially that's what what it was um, <coughs> but th this is it, it's mostly its um, political and social organization that made it uh, extremely sensitive extremely receptive um, and uh, artistically speaking and being able to essentially formulate a new uh, a new type of uh, of figurative art and the uh, part of I mean this can sound anecdotal and even kind of rhetorical in many ways, but um, it's really the model that w was offered by the uh, ancient era that in Florence, because of its own political um, organization, could have a greater uh, could take a greater root into it. Mm -hmm. um, Florence was nominally a republic. Which means something, and it had a sort of democratic regime. So, what do these words actually mean? Because uh, at this point, the idea of the res publica, it's a republican regime, was very strong in central. It, it was something relatively rare in into Europe. I mean, most of Europe at this point had 
um, undergone, especially from the second half of the 14th century and the 15th, a sort of uh, refeudalization. There had definitely been uh, existed a sort of recompactation of the um, political uh, fragmentation that had characterized a feudal Europe back in the day. Um, <coughs> so um, it's um, this process mostly passed through a sort of centralization that mostly was attached to still to a feudal um, hierarchy. Mm? So a centralized lordship, we can't say in this way. Think about this time. Well, okay, France and England are still engulfed um, into into the uh, hundred in the last part of the hundred year, years war, but it, it's still you know those are brilliant example of certain monarchies that are developing pretty fast. Also, the certain um, uh, Iberian monarchies, or if you take the uh, I don't know Bohemia or these other Germanic um, principalities that were progressively expanding and kind of emerging as such. I mean, not just as a kind of um, namely overlord, but trying slowly to also concentrate power in, into their own private hands. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. Florence, as a democratic, so-called democratic regime, was an exception even into Italy, where the majority of the um, of the powers were essentially derived from um, <coughs> were kind of mm, still feudal in nature, given that they were framed into the Holy Roman Empire um, nominally, but they had originated, in fact, from these city republics mm, that had expanded historically, not just against the rural uh, nobility, but also had fought against this, uh, you know, for, for their autonomy within the empire and had essentially um, de facto remained sort of independent um, or, however, um, maintained a very uh, autonomous form of government. It was expressed by the uh, middle classes that um, had wanted to administrate the uh, res publica, in fact, uh, in their own way. Uh, so, being mostly and chiefly mercantile republics. But the politic and this was f uh, kind of a bit of the social spectrum of these uh, cities, but um, a very few cities in Italy had developed, I actually, no city in, city in Italy had developed a republican regime like in Florence. Um, the uh, at this point, the, the Italian lordships were embodying uh, sometimes a sort of also in here of refeudal feudalization of their own ideals. It had always been in kind of like this, historically speaking, that the feudal lords kind of got a bit more um, common in 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 look. You know, they they appreciated the wealth of the mercantile classes, wanted also to to seize um, their their assets through matrimonial strategies and so on. So unavoidably ending to live in a more um, um, in a more civilized way than what the military uh, <coughs> tradition would, would want. Italy at this point was kind of the model of, or already growing as the model of, you know, the the arts, this so sophisticated lifestyle, even courtly uh, etiquette hmm, that definitely existed very strongly in other countries but uh, uh, on a feudal base um, because of the monarchical tradition but hadn't uh, been so refined in the ways and the customs like now these Italian courts were developing and most of these courts were however sort of tyrannic in nature uh, tyrannic in the most um, neutral term of uh, meaning of the term um, <coughs> also because um, tyranny at this point was being recovered also as uh, from the classical sources for, for what it really was you know indeed a lordship like it had been also back in the day but not conceived in a negative fashion I've made some videos that actually deal with this um, with this uh, perspective that for us today is very difficult to understand indeed because today for us, we, we can't renounce to any form of democratic uh, uh, political experience, and rightfully, but our concept of democracy is very, very different from the one that it was back in the past. So also in the case of Florence, 
there was nothing like you know a, a republic or a uh, or a democracy or better they meant something very different from today the republic was the theory of the ideal that was a sort of common good of the city that had to live on in this way also in a very uh, um, campanilistic way a very m narrow municipal mindset um, that was kind of the center of what the, the power had to be this was particularly strong in Florence that had maintained the most the ideal of city-state mm -hmm. <coughs> and I had not tried to expand um, also its um, rule uh, outer than you know, these autonomistic forms that were um, essentially granted to the sub subdued cities Florence was a lordship, not just like all the others, as also the Medici family actually shows. But they were still saying that theoretically their power derived from a sort of a ge a ge of um, consensual hegemony over the city, and the republican institutions of the commune were maintained. Um, simply, the whole city at this point was a private asset of the Medici family and a few others that, however, still gravitated around it. Um, and they, in this way, they, call, they could call themselves re republican and democratic in, in, in theory, um, but in practice it was still a, a lordship. Really, uh, um, in this sense, a, a, um, a, much, more a much less imposant lordship <coughs> excuse me, than... <coughs> excuse me once again. Spring is coming. Actually, it's already come. Um, but to make you understand better what I'm talking about, because this is perhaps the uh, there are two videos that deal with this, and especially with the with the uh, uh, kind of the uh, dichotomy confrontation uh, comparison. Excuse me, um, Florence Milan, mm -hmm. because Milan in this um, in this scale was on the exact opposite end. You know, Florence was the most democratic regime that said essentially that the republican, um, uh, you know, organization of the Florentine people was respected uh, by keeping, you know, uh, this uh, kind of democratic forms into which the council deliberated, even if eventually was just who owned the largest part of the money, controlled the city that really ruled. Excuse me, drink a little bit. From the other side, you have M Milan, that is um, an Italian city state that at this point is building the most idea of a centralized state, a state that functioned with a, with a structured administrative, with a, a uniform administrator, or at least an, uh, also in here it's complicated to explain, but let's say that Milan had att attempted this uh, homogenization, the standardization of the administrative practices and framing all the other cities within its own rule and so connection. They had a pretty strong military, they were also pretty rich. But all this was revolved around the idea that it was a lord. It was a, a ruling dynasty that was the one of the Visconti, then eventually the uh, the Sforza in this period as well. Um who uh, were actually um still uh, However, thinking kind of democratic, in a democratic mentality, and it's not that uh, these guys were thinking to be a sort of uh, ruling dynasty at all. You know, the Italian communes had developed always and, and being framed within the uh, feudal hierarchy. I mean, within this idea that there is a Holy Roman Emperor, that the the Italian city states belong to the Kingdom of Italy, and that they have these duties and so on, and, and that these communities have simply uh, a, a ruling because they have be managed to organize themselves, and they can do it on behalf of the in the Emperor that had granted also the titles to for for doing this. Um, so it was actually a cooperation also with the Germanic powers and so on, especially the the Milanese lordship had. Uh, basically acquired many of its prerogatives thanks to you know the Ghibelline uh, you know the, the signing with you know the emperors um, especially from during the 14th century um, and and therefore with this idea that technically speaking even who was ruling in Milan wasn't in full rule the the Lord uh, the Lord was just elected by the Milanese theoretically very theoretically, um, in the sense that it was placed there for their own uh, safety. That's essentially what the uh, the same 
feudalism in the rest of Europe had been, you know, feudalism had been born essentially by this, you know, the, everybody is free, theoretically, because all of this area uh, had this Germanic mindset for which every freeman not, not only was free, but theoretically didn't even have an over, uh, um, you know, an overlord uh, in, in the uh, fashion of a state like it had been in the Roman times. They simply had there were overlords that were were uh, were uh, put in there by uh, the people theoretically obviously the ruler preferred preferred to stress that they were chosen by god but in in this um <coughs> You know, especially in the Italian political practice, this was less, much less ideal because objectively the Italians were mm, practically uh, admitting that their uh, th such lordships were created for the sake of strictly secular reasons. Of course, they were extremely religious. They also tried to back they, um, their prerogatives in this base, but they didn't develop, for instance, a mysticism of the monarchy. It, like it would happen, it, it happened in England or in, or in France. Um, in this sense, the Germans were half away b b into the thing because at this point, the, the Holy Roman, the, the Holy Roman Empire was pretty much fragmented. The empire was holy, in fact, and had to represent theoretically Western Empire. You know, the overruler uh, of the whole uh, Western Christendom. But at the same time, uh, also in the German political practice, this was kind of even it was an elective monarchy, so it was a business of the German princes who they wanted to elect as emperors, and if these emperors had private assets on their own, it could influence the politics. So we're in a moment, in fact, we are arriving, in, we are heading towards a political practice that goes much more towards um, the the uh, you know the passage from a medieval mindset to a renaissance mindset so a complete it, it's an approximation of course um because there is so much continuity also of the medieval mentality into the the modern age much more than we are usually prone to think but definitely um you know justifying like it could happen with machiavelli a behavior uh, for the sake of the community and even going against kind of uh religion uh, in a, uh, not in theory but in practice because there was a greater good it, it's, a, it's a concept that was being developed in here it was still present uh, it had still to be developed but the idea that the political practice is something that had to be uh, real politique you know something without the void of hypocrisy was slowly also developing in and, and Italy in this sense had seen it a kind of a you know and, and, and in this sense Florence was a kind of more hypocritical because the uh, the the Visconti dynasty the Milanese lordship uh, always uh, admitted you know we are the lords we are the tyrants and we it's it's right that we are so I was advising you those um, um, videos before I made the talk in detail about this. The, the first one is Freedom and Tyranny in the Age of Humanism, Political Thought in Florence and Milan, that expresses this actually, you know, f exactly what I'm talking about right now, and it makes you understand the base from which uh, these two political thoughts stamped, so understanding how different Florence and Milan actually were in politics and society. And uh, the other is uh, Tyranny as a Lesser Evil, the Visconti Lordship that is also very uh, very important because it sh kind of also makes you reflect, at least I tried um, uh, to, to make it, um, on the, um, let's say, on how these solutions actually stem not from a bad or good mentality uh, as we would like to see it today but from certain preconditions that made those regimes developing in such a fashion because there is a lot of ideologism uh, when looking at medieval you know there were so many people who were uh, obsessed by this idea of l looking history in terms of right and wrong and good and evil and uh, it, I'm not saying that judging history morally is bad, because objectively you can't do it. The point is what you do with that information. If um, judging history morally means just having a superficial uh, view of history for which, uh, you know, the most centralized form is just evil and the other republican is better, you, 
you you're pretty much uh, wrong because just see what happened in Florence it was formally a republic but it's not because people there were intrinsically more um you know more pure and free minded it's simply that the uh, the there were certain contingencies that brought for that regime to develop in that way and if you look at how the florentine oligarchy had developed during the years you realize how much oppression in and in, in inequality and and violence um you know this passed through so um it's it, history can show you sometimes something astonishing that is sometimes it's better to have to give part of your freedom to someone to ensure a certain equilibrium then obviously it's also very ideal because in the practice it never practically ha it never really happened like this but you know the same evil that a um an authoritarian regime can express is something that can be expressed also by a democratic regime and um this is evident in many times in history you know there, there is always uh, if we want if we really want to make it a point of there's always someone has to guard it doesn't take you know to nominally call yourself a republic or a democracy for being such and i'm not making a criticism to to the west i'm not criticizing any of this and just um on the contrary because i stick to that and i'm also pretty uh, Western centric for certain standards, um, because I believe at least in certain things. And when looking at history, I am I like to 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 look at beyond what is at least what I see. It's normally discussed in in, in our uh, you know on average in our popular uh, political uh, discussions. Um, but the point I want to make is. Uh, especially in these times that were so different from us, not to, to be tricked to believe that humans were somehow distinguishable by such things. You know, I, I've met many people who were sh surely of nationalistic background who kind of tried to to back respectively the two things, either republicanism, either uh, the monarchy, uh, you know, by simply saying, you know, my place is better than the other, and I prove you that it's better like that, because if I am a, you know, the monarchy is some kind of a sacred, and we need an authority, so we're better, and it ensures more freedom than it does. The, the republic says, you know, no, because freedom can only come when everybody's free, and then therefore um, uh, we, uh, we don't need this central direction, because people are going to to go on their own so if you look at the practice the political practice of history you realize that such uh, side taking uh, are comp virtually um, useless because uh, until you don't understand how these systems worked individually and what uh, you know the general uh, you know these were this was word we were into human rights for instance so even if you want to judge with your own base, you have to understand from one side that it's it's difficult to do it because these were different times and ages. And secondly, if you want to do it still, which you definitely can, um, never forget that those periods came, um, you know, those, those societies came to develop like that simply because there were there weren't m many options objectively and if if you don't grasp those options you're just making a you're not making history you're simply judging things you don't know about and that's something you could spare yourself from from doing uh, given the overall utility of this so florence was an hypocrisy because as we have said yeah the republican uh, government was still in standing but the fact that the city was ruled b and owned uh, by a, a unique uh, family, or at least a few of them that still gravitated around these Republican offices that depended on on that family. So um, the uh, Florence at this time was really looking at the, um, in particular, at the Republican experience of Athens and Rome. And uh, also in art, as you can understand, this is pretty even as we'll see today. Um, these were ideals that went in parallel, you know, in art and in politics. Mm -hmm. The idea was the libertas, you know, so this term that is very difficult to, to translate from Latin because, yeah, there is liberty, uh, but it, it it's not, um, yeah, liberty definitely better than freedom but um, 
as it's evident because it's actually transliteration but of libertas but it's, it's still something a bit more um, shaded however let's assume it like liberty um, and in general speaking especially, especially stress in this civic values um, to which the libertas was connected so also in here an hypocrisy because it meant that only a few people could govern and what the liberty they were searching was just for these oligarchs not to be ruled by a sort of monarch but it's not that the rest of the people had enormous rights or enormous chances to to better their condition at all and um, the Florentine regime then would evolve increasingly towards a more um, centralized form. Eventually, in the 16th century, uh, it becomes even a grand duchy, so a dynasty. Even though Florence would maintain, historically speaking, always a kind of greater, you know, higher degree of, um, you know, autonomy also in the local communities in Tuscany. Considering that Florence was an enormous, um, was a uh, financial power, uh, still at this point, enormously. And Yet it it wasn't it hadn't been much, perhaps exactly because of its republicanism of its democratic nature, much of a warlike state. The Florentines were very wealthy, could re really um, field consistent armies, but they uh, relied ex usually on mercenaries that that they also distrusted and despised. They didn't like to arm their own citizens because this is also a, a very uh, characteristic. Um, you know, element of the lordships of the tyrannies actually. So also Florence wasn't um, very difficult, uh, very different from other cities from a political and military practices. Um, sometimes they they did arm their own citizens, but they didn't have any good training, any professional uh, organization. Uh, so they they kind of didn't do much of a of an impact. I think. Even the papal states were stronger than Florence at a point in military terms. Definitely cities, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, city states like Milan and Venice at this time had some of the strongest militaries in Europe, and Florence was, you know, f lagging far, far behind from this point of view. Essentially, because they were more centralized in many ways. Even if, for instance, Venice had a kind of a more democratic regime, than Milan still surely was much more. Um, oligarchic, even uh, you know, than than Florence that was. Um, so, nevertheless, it's from this general freedom that, objectively, great part in these characters that, uh, as we've seen, have pros and cons. Looking at the pros, definitely, uh, one of these is that Florence was inhabited by many families that could that were um, still kind of participating to the political life, uh, even if in, in this mostly f seniorly framed um, situation, um, and that were wealthy enough to provide uh, for their own a, a very good education. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea um, that being an extremely cultured person the new the the ancient models classicism actually um also the uh, the base um, finding the uh, uh, new ways to express this elitism in way uh, was possible among these florentine oligarchs because they uh, they were arguably living in the most educated city in the world at that point um they had power prestige for their own family they they were also kind of not just theoretical intellectuals but they were deeply um engaged into the political um life of the city despite uh, you know being reduced to certain but this was also an international center i mean uh, florence had was very important for the political balance of uh, of late medieval europe so there were many uh Definitely many um, interests, also mm, international interests, to have this form of education, being able to c deal. Also, diplomacy was developing as an art in itself. This is the moment in which the, the first 
kind of even permanent courts. Uh, begin telling the truth, not in Florence. Flor Florence was one of, wasn't one of, of of these. But let's say sometimes we we forget how diplomacy doesn't need to exist just through the permanence of a uh, of a seat of a diplomatic seat. Um, the uh, you know diplomacy is something that always existed throughout all the Middle Ages, um, and it w contacts with other centers with other powers were extremely intense. And definitely Florence also. Um, was very advanced from this point of view, and Florentine erudition and and and, uh, and educative educative models were definitely um, pretty much alive, pretty much um, you know functioning, uh, and and recognized as uh, as very very good by by all but many others. You know, the uh, Florence was already perceived at the time to be at the uh, kind of the top um, of the uh, of uh, the, ar the artistical development like in this case um, than, than any other place uh, uh, in Europe at that point so how did this uh, happen well um, we've seen what were the cultural, you know, the political and social premises, culturally speaking, at this point, many Florentines were increasingly more interested into classical works. Mm. This happened since a very early age. The Florentines had kind of pioneered all the discovery of, of the classics, the humanistic mindset uh, back in, in the day. It wasn't something that just happened like many people think uh, it's just because uh, now the, the Byzantines were fleeing from the Turks so they, they were starting to go into Europe as refugees and bringing these Greek classical texts. Mm, the Westerners had actually progressed far beyond um, themselves and if they were so capable of adopting and um, putting to good um, use uh, the classical texts it's because they already knew them. And they already knew their value, and they already had a structural base on which to to develop it differently from uh, from other uh, regions of the world. And the Byzantine Empire at this point had still these books there, but they didn't do a great much in terms of development. It was a pretty stagnant system. Uh, Italy at this point was arguably the most advanced country in Europe, and they uh, were substantially using this knowledge to essentially built on the top of what they had already managed to build in terms of technological development etc education and so on so never mistake you know the, never confuse the, the idea uh, never confuse you know uh, what triggers technology with what and, and education and culture and, 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 and knowledge with you know simply simply you know a book that comes and people read it and everything Roberts uh, once again. This is probably one of the most naive, um, incon historically inconsistent, um, and definitely historically wrong um, conceptions you can have when you look at the Renaissance. The Renaissance is born for very precise political and social reasons, not because uh, a book came from, from somewhere else. Um, humans are enough intelligent to develop things on their own without needing a book needing them to do what to do um, it's very difficult for us to understand because of objectively today we rely so much on books for for this but um, and this is something that started in fact from the Renaissance in part because in the Renaissance the value of the, the books of the knowledge also this uh, newly um, scientifically oriented thought uh, was um, uh, is at the base of our love for the books as such. Medieval times had been, however, much more um, seen a, a much greater complementarity of practice with theory. Also, because theory cannot exist without practice, um, and the um, if you don't try, you can't get that knowledge. Um, this is what history. Of of technology, philosophy of science, tell us, you know, uh, it what really makes the progress is failure. Because if you didn't have that failure, and failure happens only from practice, because you can speculate all what you want, and that also can serve, obviously. But that all comes from a sort of progressed knowledge that kind of, you know, people started without knowing much, then eventually evolved uh, in it. So 
um, about the same roots of the Renaissance in this sense. So for in this moment in which books were kind of being revalued and priced for themselves, that is something that already existed throughout all the, the world Middle Ages, but now was done in a very uh, much more elitistic way. Something that starts here, and it starts for these political and social premises, not because someone decided, you know, this kind of fashion. In fact, um, we look at the Renaissance sometimes um, very naively as a form of a democratization. You know, the idea that the Renaissance was kind of passing by the um, uh, the tyrannic uh, feudal rule of the Middle Ages and getting something more rational and democratic. This is completely false. Um, if anything, Renaissance was born essentially from the uh, contraction of the uh, common freedoms um, during the uh, late Middle Ages. Um, up to the Black Death, Europe had developed in a much more democratic fashion than uh, in, in the, it would become uh, a few centuries later. Um, the 15th century is a moment of great crystallization of society, of hierarchization, of stratification, um, and Renaissance is the uh, the proof of this, because the, the humanists were essentially people who were paid by the courts, by these patrons who were uh, very wealthy and could um, destine uh, part of their income to this research. It was 90% mostly phytological, so also the accomplishment in saint, you know, in the achievements in the scientific field were relatively, uh, you know, low. Um, relatively, I'm not saying it wasn't. Obviously, it was a great development, also from a technical, technological point of view. But what also we don't see at this point, it's because it's still an early age, is that, of course, we have. Uh, now all the treatises from from these humanists now that start v writing to write a lot of things and that were copied and, and so on but this was just the tip of the iceberg um, the renaissance was made actually by all these s s um, skilled uh, craftsmen and artisans and, and, and people who had a very strong material knowledge that was at the base of what eventually uh, the the same um, the, the same humanists could live for because we're, these were essentially highly privileged people who worked for these lords in their courts and therefore on the backs of of millions who worked essentially for that lordship to, to, to be in state um, so also the um, classicism and elitism that was developed in these times was a highly, in fact um, narrow uh, part of the potential that European society had had up to a few centuries before. Uh, this happens frequently. It's a time usually when uh, with the middle class is going crisis, there is this contraction in uh, economical potential, technological growth. And this happened many times, historically speaking. Everyone's, uh, you know, uh, this had happened. I know it's difficult to, to, to explain also, you know, giving a comparative examples because every context is very different from the other but one from the other but it's pretty obvious that even the same Italian Renaissance at this point even though being so elitistic was born where actually was born in kind of the most democratic areas of Europe at this point because the Italians were all split yes they ho they had these these lords but still their societies were kind of mercantile in nature they were strong um middle classes still compared to other areas of Europe that were instead much more uh, stratified and hierarchical with these monarchies and so on and th there was also less economical potential so also in Italy you see that this um, ideological development this uh, renewal in, in all the fields of knowledge of art started from a base that was still also pre uh, much more uh, much freer than other areas of Europe um, But the point I want to make still is exactly this, that the, um, the um, humanistic culture was still very elitistic mm -hmm. and it tended and it influenced us massively. Uh, just for once, for instance, um, think about the same concept of the Middle Ages. It was the humanists who invented it, which is a derogatory term, contemporary uh, contemporary uh, term 
the, the, because it was coined because of these people believed now that were so pure and so highly sophisticated and so educated just because they had managed to to write like in the Latin Britain in in the first century BC that everything that had happened from that time to to theirs was essentially a middle age just an accident you know something that um you know went down and uh, it was useless to know because uh, nobody could 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 know latin well and believe me as you know i i love roman history i love latin i love um, i also love humanism i actually love very much this parts of the I also my artistical preferences in history go towards the Renaissance. I love the Renaissance very much, but at the same time I can't. Uh, and this is mostly because I'm biased as a medievalist. Probably I can't avoid to recognize the hypocrisy and the kind of the intellectual cruelty of these uh, humanists, who albeit very beautiful to read, albeit very interesting, very fascinating mindsets and so on, were actually sticking to a model. It wasn't even a matter of being, you know, of thinking and saying bad things about it. It's simply that these people were not free thinkers at all. O also think about this. If you write, if you work just because there is someone who pays you for working, you're doing what that person pays you for. You're saying what that person wants you to say. And this was pretty normal. It's always been like this in history. I mean, every kind of uh, regime has always had people who were ca very capable, intellectually speaking, and were paid, however, for essentially backing that regime and not actually to, to decide that there were some rebels every once in a while. But, you know, uh, at the time, it was not seen as, you know, as a viable option. These people felt themselves quite quite proud to work at the court of their sovereigns, to live in that part of Europe, to have this kind of privilege. So it wasn't even seen in perspective as a negative, a very negative thing. Although there was criticism as well, this is not uh, very important. So the uh, we've seen how classical works had been so important in this um, artistical revival. Um, and it, among these intellectuals it was felt that also um, were um, sometimes also freer than, than I would just said, because especially in, in Florence, um, these intellectuals very often mm, were seeing each other into circles that were very free, very open, there were exchanges of ideas, something that will kind of increase in this kind of um, um, uh, circles is, is the right word, but uh, uh, maybe uh, we can't say the, uh, the social cultural gatherings, the salons, uh, as you want to call them, you know, where these people met and exchanged ideas and they thought, and, and obviously a confrontation, um, uh, you know, confrontation is always very important, intellectually speaking. You can't read lots of books in your life if you've, if you've never learned how to deal with someone. Um, much of your thoughts are going to be raked, you're going to be influenced by uh, unrealistic ideals. So this confrontation is also very, very important, and these circles were definitely most um, developed in, uh, among the most developed in the world at that, that point, if not the most developed in the world. And, um, and w one of, however, the positive experiences of the Renaissance that I praise very much now, and I have said many bad things about the Renaissance, and can also list something that is practically um, very good, is the need for a concrete experience of reality. This is very important because, um, as we were saying before, the scientific and technological knowledge was increasingly appreciated at this point, so there was the idea, at least, uh, that uh, reality could be experienced um, directly, could be measured, could be um, dominated by mathematical princes, uh, principles, um, and it it could help mankind to really reach that perfect um, position, that perfect role into the reality that, that God had basically entrusted to him. Um, many people were uh, at this time were also accused of atheism, kind of like this, because objectively, um, together with this, uh, you know, this new Renaissance, there were so many 
uh, you know, the arrival of the classics brought definitely to a, also a renewed interest in, in paganism. Also, in a lot of occult um, um, sciences that were definitely anti. Uh, I can't say really anti-Christian because really the whole Christian Middle Ages was dominated by magics, by alchemy, by this idea that um, there were so the spirits in in the world that somehow belonged and pertained to the, the the design of creation, even if they maybe were negative forces that could be called and used through these formulas and so on. So it was nothing new, but definitely the recovery of the classical models was uh, very strongly tied also to this uh, revival of interest into paganism, I mean, there's also this questioning of religion. Um, there were many texts, philosophically speaking, theologically speaking, um, that were uh, recovered from uh, Neoplatonism, for instance. Plato this time was thought actually to have um, it wasn't directly known. They thought Plotinus was Plato. They, they were reading it in Florence. In fact, at this point, they discovered it just with uh, philological research uh, later on. Um, but the idea was also here, kind of mixing once again, uh, also with the renewed interest in the uh, original sources in Greek, in Latin, um, to to reintegrate or to conciliate or or how to create a, a, a functional synthesis of the classical knowledge with the Christian one. Mm. Also from a scientific point of view and sometimes with certain thoughts that uh, could have been seen or conceived as also kind of borderline from a Christian point of view. Mm. Um, the um, This need to adhere to the concrete experience of reality translated itself into the creation of a perspectival construction. Um, um, and also a technical construction that could be based on mathematic rules. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, uh, to, mm, uh, to reproduce through, uh, through these a um, bidimensional surface and um, over a bidimensional surface and uh, an image in, tri in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And while this kind of allegorical uh, language of medieval art was being um, surpassed, uh, space began to be punctually measured and reproduced in, in a scale uh, according to a scientific method. And a very important work that shows this is the De Pictura, so on painting, written by um, one of the uh, greatest figures of, um, of, of, the, of the Renaissance at this time, that is uh, Leon Battista Alberti, who was a polymath, so one of these greatest uh, omniscient, <laughs> practically, um, figures of the Renaissance. Uh, he was an architect, a uh, writer, a mathematician, a humanist, cryptographer, linguist, philosopher, musician, and archaeologist. Mm. He was uh, he was from Genoa, um, but he worked also extensively in, in Florence, he also died in Rome. He lived to throughout basically almost the whole um, 15th century and is um, it's, it's very difficult even to introduce as a figure. He, um, he actually belonged to the second generation of the humanists um, as being born in the 15th century well the first one had been last in the previous uh, generation and he uh, kind of dominated in so many many fields uh, at the time and 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 his interest was principally aimed at finding the research of new rules theories and practices in order to guide the work of the artist so he had an extremely um, didactic intention. The De Pictura, so today we'll just talk about painting, but he was paired with other works um, like uh, the the statua, for instance, on the statue that um, you know, into which he exposed the proportions of a human body. Um, in, in the De Pictura he basically gave us this first definition of scientific pr perspective we'll focus on. And also he wrote um, to also to his death, on the De Re uh, Edificatori, mm, 
so he uh, in here he described basically all the uh, you know variety of the modern uh, architecture he was living in uh, and underlying especially the importance of the different typologies of buildings uh, according to their function so this work especially rendered uh, Leon Battista Alberto kind of an immortal figure in the centuries and um, the the point of reference of figures like uh, Violet Le Duc or uh, Ruskin so um, uh, he um, Leon Battista Alberti together with uh, Filippo Brunelleschi he is considered the founder of Renaissance architecture thanks to, to his work and he had a very innovative mindset objectively um, both in the architectonical and humanistic field and um, naturally he reconsidered this modern um, uh, fields um, on, on on a classical, uh, in you know, to to be rebuilt to a classical um, uh, on the base of the classical knowledge, and uh, so, but not just simply replicating them, but also understanding them and being able to reproduce them, also adapted to different contexts, and and this is very definitely very important because actually also. Uh, you know, the Renaissance ha Renaissance art hasn't just copied uh, the uh, the ancient culture, its it civilization. It also kind of re-expressed it, it reformulated in different ways. And this is kind of the healthy Renaissance I like because um, it still brings together with it so much knowledge, so much civilization that is actually the one that was formed during the Middle Ages. And gave Renaissance art a much deeper, much more sensitive touch than, than, I can say that the ancient one that that already had it, but kind of expanded it also towards more direction, also with more arcane meanings to, um, and uh, once again I I would have to uh, to do kind of uh, to deepen the topic, but the most important thing now is to remember that Alberti was part of this privileged. Um, social class of the uh, enlightened uh, or high uh, enlightened aristocracy or kind of upper middle class uh, uh, upper gentry I don't know you, how you want to call it um, uh, all, uh, that was developing in Italy at this point and had so much fortune into um, into actually all over Italy um, he worked for the Gonzaga in Mantua, he in Florence, for the Malatesta in Rimini, uh, and once again for the uh, Rucellai in in Florence. So also these were mm, uh, thinkers that were um, sometimes were working on the dependency of these families. Also were so important. So it's important not that that these figures didn't just revolve around a court, but revolved around this. Um, kind of, you know, noble families that were still um, very powerful, but still also very different in mindset. Kind of more open compared, and, and as urban classes compared to, say, the aristocratic, the aristocratic world of the feudal elite. Uh, also in Italy, there were there was um, there were some families were very different in this in this way think about for instance uh, Lorenzo de Medici marriage with um, uh, with the Orsini um, uh, the, he uh, the Orsini were a, a Roman family that were all about war essentially they were typical feudal um, family of knights that fought and so on and Florence uh, at this point was instead kind of the kind of the hymn to not to commonality, but you know this kind of more refined, less um, war-based uh, idea. That um, also in here was it, it's very interesting. Also, how the, the Renaissance had to to cope the synthesis between the Roman model of war and the Greek model, essentially of not of pacifism, but of let's say a refusal of war as a um, at least for the polis period, so not the Hellenistic world, but the Hellenic world, as a professional lifestyle. So also in here, there were these contrasts sometimes between the, the various cultures of... Um, and, and Florence was a bit an exception, in the sense that also in the rest of Italy, um, 
it was mostly the feudal model that prevailed, as the lordships now were looking mostly at the feudal model, so because these lordships had emerged from from the commoners, so they also wanted to feel kind of more framed to this feudal hierarchy and not... And Florence wasn't doing it. Florence wasn't doing it. They were essentially saying, we are Florentine's point. So also this municipalism, this campanilism, was kind of also productive towards the Middle Ages because this community had no reason to, to change to towards something more like a feudal. feudal. And, and all these families that gravitated around the uh, the republic were in fact so kind of free and um and were extremely there was more dynamism there is more competition just think about this you know uh, when you have a system that is kind of all versed towards one direction and, and there is a, a unique chief substantially and you have less internal competition when you have instead kind of a more republican democratic system, you have also lots of people who are freer to use, and this is also an economical thing, to compete, to, to make emerge the very best. And and if, it, if this is coupled with, with wealth, which is normally the case, because democratic regimes usually happen when there is a higher degree of wealth per capita compared to, to, to other authoritarian regimes, to, to monarchies and so on, well, at that point there is a good chance that there is also a greater humans to, to take these resources from, and this is what was happening in Italy at the time, and why these uh, polymaths like Leon Battista Alberti, but also many other artists of the time, were, um, uh, you know, were drawn from by the these families that could do it on their own, also to compete one for the other, because these people were building palaces, uh, were, you know, showing off, you know, sp- uh, statues with uh, with paintings and so on, so there was a race for, literally, for, for who did really the best uh, competition, for who did the best work of art, who looked more sumptuous, who looked more realistic and so on, and these new models of geometrical realism were definitely uh, so um, uh, so prized because they witnessed this know-how behind the, the sheer work of art that naturally also was loaded with many other meanings uh, to celebrate mostly the family of the committants and, and so on. So the, the pictura that we mentioned before, um, this work was uh, written by uh, Alberti in 1436, um, um, is, as we said before, the uh, represents the canonization of perspective hmm, as the scientifical founding of the artistical work. Hmm. So it, it's in particular um, during the first twenties of the uh, 15th century that you have these first true fully perspectival experiments by initiative of uh, chiefly of Filippo Brunelleschi. Hmm. Uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, we should maybe uh, spend a word about him. He was uh, also in here uh, another polymath, essentially. He was a Florentine. He uh, was born in 1377 and died in 1446. He was an architect, an engineer, sculptor, mathematician, uh, goldsmith as well, um, uh, scenographer as well. So you see these uh, men who were kind of uh, 360 degrees in, in every kind of um, visual kind of um, 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 craft that from you know scenographies to jewelry to buildings you know everything that could be used by this powerful family to, to kind of show off and he is considered um, considered naturally the first engineer and, and projector of the um, modern age and he uh, was uh, one of the great other great um, figures that of the uh, that s- kind of started the s- the fully the so-called Florentine Renaissance, together with uh, Donatello, famously enough, and Masaccio. And in 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 particular, Brunelleschi was kind of the older one, and he worked a bit like a a master for the other two we mentioned, and the. And, and we owe to him the invention of perspective with this um, this kind of um, centric linear perspective with a point basically on, on the background that represents the horizons from which all the uh, various lines have to be drawn when 
you uh, you want to trace these figures in, in, in and deline delineate their borders in, in to make them uh, fitting in in space uh, perspectively. Um, so he had started like an, a goldsmith as an apprentice goldsmith, and he also made a career as a sculptor. And then uh, eventually. Uh, he dedicated himself to architecture and building uh, almost exclusively in his native Florence um, several mm, lay and religious buildings that were to, to be uh, extremely famous chiefly uh, the, the, um, the dome of uh, Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence is this engineer's engineering masterpiece um, built without um, now also that would be interesting to explain but we don't have many time but let's say it was a, a, an amazing feat for medieval engineering um, and the the idea is that with Brunelleschi you have the uh, kind of the uh, the birth of the modern architect you know this um, who was not just a um, directly engaged into the technical and um, work but um, he so also you know assisting to the construction and looking at, and in the first place but also giving this um, very strong impulse um, and substantial impulse at in terms of the uh, awareness of, of a projectual phase so not just using a m mechanical knowledge but also uh, becoming um, a full intellectual that could practice this liberal art that is based on theoretical princi uh, principles such as mathematics, uh, geometry, and also historical awareness. Because as we have seen, these all these models were coming from from the past, from the Roman, from the classical age. Um, so historical awareness was fundamental to understand really what the the ancient world had been about, studying the the ancient treatises on architecture and knowing how to you know to apply this knowledge was definitely uh, required definitely a great uh, knowledge also of, of the past as an historian um, and the, the one of the characteristics of Brunelleschi's architecture was sticking to certain models as a base that were to be expressed into entire numbers uh, from which you could basically multiplicate and subdivide um, so to um, to mm, es essentially uh, find out the, the, the proportion of an entire uh, building um, and he brought in uh, still the, the full arc with uh, no you know the uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, I'll do it in a second. So all principles actually were coming from the uh, from the ancient world. Oh, finally, and an effing works now. Okay. So the the round arc, mm -hmm. the round arc without the uh, the the. Um, and not just the the pointed arc. Mm -hmm. This was important. It required certain different materials. In fact, the uh, the dome of uh, Santa Maria uh, del Fiore is, uh, in, in this sense, created exactly also with this idea that the dome had to be progressively built with lighter material. Uh, the more it approached to the top, you know, very. Con and this is a bit looking at like at the Roman Pantheon. Um, and other domes that were built really with a know-how. It was amazing for the time that was being recovered, um, also thanks to the studying of these um, classical sources. Um, so the um, there is an intent um, towards the purity of the forms. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, into which also the decorative elements have a kind of architectonical meaning also from 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 the structure 
um, there is also a great attention for the kind of materials as we have said that was used there is a huge amount of works we could um, we could listen here um, the uh, mm, I'm sorry if I'm, I've chosen also very few pictures now but um, it would be beautiful to, to show them all as um, there is so much really to to there would be so much really to to tell um, also very importantly at this time there was a rediscovery of uh, also of not just of the written knowledge of the classical world but also the studying of the Roman ruins that uh, in, cities, uh, in Italy obviously as you can expect in Rome her itself were uh, this time starting to be appreciated also as works of art and as models not just like caves to draw material from 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 the other constructions had uh, as it had often happened um, during the Middle Ages and the mm, the mm, method Brunelleschi's method was applied also in the work of uh, Donatello that we've man uh, mentioned mentioned before uh, uh, also here we, we we're talking about one of uh, said before one of the greatest uh, figures of uh, the uh, Italian Renaissance um, and as a sculptor a painter and a goldsmith as well and he, he had a very long career he actually he lived also rather long for that time he was born in 1386 and died in 1466 and he's considering as we said before, together with Brunelleschi and Masaccio, one of the three fathers of the Italian, uh, excuse me, the Fl Florentine Renaissance, and one also one of the most celebrated sculptors of all times, and he uh, he really gave this great impulse to the renewal of the methods of of sculpture and um, essentially abandoning the experience of the late Gothic art and um, and even surpassing this is the point the uh, the classical Roman art mm -hmm. so actually developing a different kind of expressionism that um, is kind of also more mm, what I was saying before kind of more um, vivacious thanks to the um, to the the legacy that the the same Middle Ages now was being abandoned, however, had um, excuse me, it was being recovered. So um, he invented uh, several, you know, uh, different styles, and um, he um, now it's kind of complicated. There are many tactical uh, tricks he used to render certain certain also uh, illusory space that is very interesting in this sense and um, it uh, worked with, with a huge amount of different materials and um, he made for instance the uh, he also was a drawer, uh, a designer, he made models for the uh, glasses of the dome of uh, the Cathedral of Florence for instance and um, he was able however to infuse also humanity and psychological introspections to his works even with uh, very dramatic accents of energy of vitality that were contained but still still very visible um, if you go to the Uffizi in, in uh, you know it, it, well okay th there is plenty actually things you could really uh, really see but um, wh whatever we, we can't go excessively in detail today also don't have time excuse me for this um, when we talk about uh, Masaccio as well and look at his uh, his figures of the last of the triad, um, we see this other great. He he was he died actually very young. Unfortunately, um, he was born in 1401 and died in 1428. He was mainly a painter, mm -hmm. and and it's a it's a it's kind of a tragedy for human civilization that he died so so young. 
and in, he was one of the beginners of the so-called um, uh, also he renewed painting essentially um, he he was characterized by the idea that the decorative elements had to leave at least the, the decorative excesses and the artificiality of certain that existed in the style of the contemporary uh, art had to be surpassed and that there had to be a more vigorous vision that had to be an even more um, more material, more concrete in many ways. He actually um, before we mentioned Giotto who had ga uh, given this kind of more volumetric synthesis uh, in art so um, uh, he uh, Masaccio basically brings the Brunelleschi's uh, perspective and perspective and the plastic force of uh, Donatello. Mm. So he brought them together and he mm, fuses uh, he mel he combines them into painting. Um, Vasari commented that he uh, was able to render his figures extremely alive and giving them this immediate feeling of um, you know of concreteness of vitality that uh, uh, also of plastic material vision that was so close to to reality uh, in many ways um and he also um, pioneered the uh, chiaroscuro, for instance. Uh, uh, he um, uh, that he used naturally to, to give more uh, plasticity, more volume to, to the figure, so showing you know its um, its substance. There are beautiful. Um, um, I could list, you know, there is the uh, Chris Christ crucified in, in Naples, that, or um, there is also the uh, uh, so many. Actually, if you um, w one of the greatest um, probably masterpieces is the um, I don't know how to say it in English, but you know when uh, Adam and Eve are expelled from the. Um, uh, Garden of Eden um, in uh, in the Brancacci Chapel in Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence. So it's uh, one of the earliest masterpieces showing these human bodies um, kind of in, in their reality because that was the meaning also of the message or Christ among the Apostles. Uh, um, there were so many beautiful. There is in London the Madonna with a Child, um, the Magi Adoration. It, look Masaccio because he did uh, really something uh, amazing he's in, in his own times and especially the Trinity that's the probably this painting that was made in Santa Maria Novella uh, in the second half of the uh, you know the, the year the 20s of the 15th century that represents in this sense the uh, first great expression of perspectival painting um and this this is probably you know the uh, the revival of perspective was probably the greatest most most meaningful gain of the florentine revival um really marking neatly the uh, surpassing of uh, the passing of the medieval conception of reality mm. and not just in f in the figure in itself but considering what it meant at the time i mean both the the reconsideration of the role of, of mankind and of the artist in in painting. So the real now this was probably the greatest gain. The real could be rationally um, no. It wasn't just something that had to be revealed. It had to be somewhat um, figured out or guessed or interpreted. It it could be rationally um, at no. Um, and, and, and it was especially at the me measure of man. 
and this is very important because of, from a religious point of view this is you know how many masterpieces still at this point were dedicated to the humanity of Christ which is very important in Christianism I mean the idea that your God is essentially like you is a, a measure of man because Christ is a man has a, 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 a human nature not just a divine one um, so this was kind of celebrated in the, into this revival, into this rebirth, all the various metaphors, the idea of of a re of a rebirth, substantially. And the uh, the artist wasn't just uh, he who basically managed to to carry out a uh, a mechanical skill, a mechanical craft that doesn't have to be um, despised at all, because these crafts still entailed not just a you know uh, kind of a automatic m movement for which everybody could do it the medieval art medieval art is uh, dominated by a skill and craft that was kind of unique there were several schools that influenced each other also in the 14th century Italian painting is kind of extraordinary we've seen with Jot also there is this this prodromes this idea that the the flat bi-dimensional picture had can to evolve to something more concrete, something more um, human-like, but it was felt as, in this sense, as kind of an arcane knowledge. Mm -hmm. At this point in the Renaissance, so towards the modern age, we have something very different. That is, you do not ju you need a craft, an art, like was telling Latin, but um, and, and not just you didn't just know how to handle matter, for instance, which is, you know, essentially a very miserable thing compared to the divine per perfection as such, because it's just matter, it's decaying, it's not. But the, the artist became kind of the, um, kind of a genius, essentially, who, who managed to go beyond and to which his intellectual and creative capacities couldn't even could even ar arrive to compete with with the religion itself this is why before it was saying you know this is also a very bold statement telling the truth but the the idea is principally that um at this point men can also arrive to to essentially to know god theoretically at least um, to to have this enormous confidence that this is at the base of the humanism during the Renaissance that that the man can almost arrive to to touch God and to um, uh, to to know it and obviously it's impossible because um, God is beyond uh, even the, the human measurement um, it's immeasurable mm -hmm. um, but um, still uh, humanity can tend towards that infinite even in here also the discovery of maths of this absolute uh, measurement this rational calculations was in fact so um, close to the uh, the idea you could arrive to the infinite um, in theory or at least you could tend towards that direction so that by approximation you could practically um, it, it was as if you could arrive to contemplate God in, in this way um, so um, there would be actually a lot to say about this again but uh, it's objectively not easy even to discuss such things. Um, I I would like to stop here for today, also because I have other things to do. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, this is kind of the concept I wanted to to give. And so we have split a little bit video between this initial consideration about the the preconditions that brought the Florentine Renaissance to start in that specific context. So, a lot of money, a, a, a relatively egalitarian environment, and therefore more competition, more study, more autonomous research, 
Um, and at the same time, looking at what these new concepts were about in the field of painting and the rediscovery of perspective, the rationalization um, of of the um, of the human space in 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 the represent in the figurative arts um, and much else um, related to it in terms of um, approaches and mentality and mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and can we make a conclusion, general conclusion about you know, for instance, why this you know. Is there something beyond? I think so, and I would like to comment on this because I made a, can you, uh, I, I made I think only one video that was a pretty strange one, <laughs> given my standards. And I actually stick to the um, kind of to the essentials. Um, I mean, to, of the topics I, I generally choose. Once I made a video on <laughs> Renaissance and, of, and humanism, personal considerations, so probably the only video <laughs> in which I indulged um, into this kind of uh, self uh, explanation about my own per perceptions and view on, on, on Re Renaissance. And you have to understand. It, Obviously, you're listening to a medievalist talking, and I don't give a damn being a medievalist specifically. I, I even have problems of defining myself a historian for real, <laughs> for respect towards history. And I think most people, either we are all historians or kind of no one is. So it's not having spent some years at university to, to, to be able to, to qualify yourself as such, in my opinion. But, um, um, so I'm biased, however, because... I obviously see in the humanists kind of the evil, <laughs> absolute evil, the having um, created the same concept of, of of the Middle Ages. I made a video also just recently um, uh, called "Periodizing the Middle Ages" that deals with that. It's a pretty after video, but it, it it covers in part also this idea: of what is the Middle Ages, why, and where it was formulated. Um, and these are very important things because you realize there was no Middle Ages ever. So sometimes I, I feel, I, and I just like with that video, I felt the need to um, I would say stress how much the Renaissance is epiphenomenal in many ways. This probably is a, use, it is a term I'm using Rather, rather much. I have still a very materialistic view of, um, actually not materialist view, <laughs> quite quite the contrary. Actually, I'm pretty balanced between um, materialism and idealism when it comes to, you know, what is the history um, really is moved really by. Because I, as I've said to you before, I'm I'm mostly leaning towards the. Um, towards structuralism, but not because I, I believe in it. I mean, uh, for me, sometimes the human mind can be, even way more influent. But what I think is still that what the majority of history is at the same time is still about structural matters. So, which doesn't mean that things have necessarily to evolve into a certain direction or that they have to, uh, you know, be dictated. Uh, chiefly by structure, because objectively what these um, Italian humanists did in Florence and then also when humanism spread all over the other countries. Now, today we're talking about Florence, but also in the rest of Italy, in the rest of Europe, it was plenty of humanists. So they, they, this is also a very forgotten chapter. For instance, if you take Germany, it had a kind of a beautiful humanism. It's, humanism and the Renaissance are not all about Italy at all. Italy was kind of the dominating, mm, uh, you know, the, the leading country in this, but it, it was a fallout also from the same Italy to all the other countries that kind of developed um, a renaissance all with its own characteristics. Mm. Um, so never forget about this. Um, but wh what I'm saying is um, what we see from the renaissance is something, aside from the stereotypes that they the, the humanists themselves have left us you know, the way we look at history, the, the Middle Ages, and so on. But it's still very epiphenomenal, which means that you know if you go to the Sistine Chapel and you remain 
amazed by it and you that's something like a kind of a uh, Stendhal syndrome that can take you there if you go into the uh, it happened to me when I went to to to, to the dome to the cathedral of Florence when I entered there I kind of felt choking and I had tears in my eyes and I couldn't say anything for for a couple of minutes because I felt so amazed by such an experience it's something that's going to remain to you because at, the mo at an emotional level that's something you can you can't really forget but the point I'm making is um, there isn't just that I mean all you see from the Renaissance also in terms of you know of, uh, works of art and uh, you know written works and so on it, it, it's something that remained naturally in the centuries because it was important it was at the base of our modern uh, world um, it, it all started from there in so many ways but still there is so much about you know less resounding aspects of life that were however the the real life at the time that went lost forever um, it's very um, this is you know you as an example you can make it even with um, many uh, with every place in the world I mean you go sometimes to certain countries um, on vacations and you see a something that hits you particularly uh, I don't know a ruin a, a building or some work of art and maybe around there is not a big much this is you know if you go into Western Europe you're kind of more spoiled because eventually these were lands that more or less kept growing historically speaking so they also managed to preserve more and to build more uh, next to it but if you go into other countries I'm thinking about especially um, I mean, sometimes there, there are a few, just a few traces from the past, uh, even of a very grandiose past. And you say, but what, you know, what about all the things we have left? I mean, my fear sometimes is that with Renaissance is that as if that polarizes the attention. Also, I am completely allergic to all those um, uh, fictions uh, they make. Um, TV shows they make on things like the 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 Borgia and the Manichae because that's utter rubbish from a strictly historical point of view. They can be entertaining how you like. I have actually never watched them, but it was enough like to, you know, to, to understand what they were about and say okay, no, because I, I can't. Um, that was so stupid. I mean, if you want to make a, a similar history, at least don't don't stain uh, history. <laughs> you know, with don't say. Uh, I mean, take another context taken and invent something take a story like I don't know invent Game of Thrones and, and do it uh, are you like do not touch history unnecessarily and especially if you spend lots of money for making an historically themed uh, fiction why don't you try to do it to spend those money not to make more um, episodes or to pay you know the most famous actors do it do it trying to invest a little bit more on historical I'm not saying historical correctness but in historical substance because I don't see the point of I mean I know I'm limited probably in this but I don't see the point of seeing something that is based is historically speaking and and not investing more into it yeah, especially given that uh, now I don't want to digress because this is too too much of a I, I believe I mean I understand the reason why these people do it it's just it's because and this happens also in cinema and at this point uh, in everything that there is a very short range um, goal you know I believe that all these fictions are made etc they they are done usually by saying okay we spend a relatively contained uh, you know may, maybe much money but just investing on the people on what the people are mostly attracted by by standards so doing this kind of sens uh, sensationalistic things you know with things and violence and sex and uh, and famous actors and so on so that you know that people are gonna watch it anyway so you you know that you're gonna make that base of money and and that's it um, that's very short term and and that's what you realize that nobody actually looks at movies anymore and says okay I remember that movie from that year nobody gives a damn anymore there is a, a very few movies a story that that people kind of like it that they're looking all kind of almost all alike there's also even the actors seem to be so much uniformed and st stereotype in, in time we're co coming to a sort of serious 
uh, like there is no interest in making kind of an artistical depiction if I were f if I had money to spend for a an historically themed movie I would try to do something that uh, aside from historical accuracy that would stand in the mind of people for its I don't know for its meaning I mean beyond such things sens uh, such a sensationalism I would like to do something that that really o also made you feel something deeper um, in terms of you know reasoning on on human mind on human nature and especially in these historical movies I I would try to to show a very different reality from from what we stereotypically see why indulging on that stereotype um it, I know it pays probably because that's the 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 obvious uh, the most obvious thing but also this uh, with the Renaissance I'm so talking about this because with the Renaissance this is done and particularly with the Italian Renaissance this is done all the time all the freaking time now I've seen also the the um, uh, this mostly comes from the Anglosphere it's also a very peculiar kind of strange relation with um, you know the, the, the Italian Renaissance is kind of dramatized and always in the, the, there is this kind of dark gloomy pictures just like for the Spanish Black Legion or you know th this world that also watches at another and uh, it's too bad the Italians don't produce much from, from their perspective for instance but I've seen there is something for instance um, the French every once in a while make some kind of historically themed movie that is perhaps okay they don't invest much on that but I've seen certain series that I don't know whether they were there was one of the Habsburgs was done in Spain it was actually pretty boring up to a certain point also historically not excessively correct but at least I don't know they showed the characters they they showed their real relations they didn't indulge in this r rubbish you know with the Borgia they're just a bunch of perverts um, just because people can't even read the sources correctly or um, or they have to show this continuous fun even with the Medici the Medici was despicable let's let's be honest about it I, I had the lucky uh, the luck not to see it but I, I sometimes passed by by the TV where other people <laughs> in my family watching it and I say oh my god I, I'm, I'm happy not to watch this because you know why why the, the recently they made that thing about um, uh, Outlaw King uh, about Robert Bruce that that seemingly was nice at least for uh, terms of historical accuracy some of kind of the best things that I've ever made but also in there I think have some criticism towards it uh, but at least um, that was that was fine it was uh, I mean as long as you improve you can still criticize but let's say to say well we're heading towards that direction what it seems to me is that there is no 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 need to to improve most of the times I don't know why uh, I don't know uh, I still belong to a generation is relatively young maybe well and I see that in my generation there is kind of an interest for this histo historical accuracy and maybe when my generation will make more money will enter into the business maybe we'll see kind of better movies themed more on accuracy and trying to to stress much but there is always this kind of approximation that you re realize to to start from a superficial view of history and this is uh, kind of all this long uh, unnecessary rant um, is, is is to say in history never look just at the main picture don't look and, and, and I mean literally especially in the case of the Renaissance everybody loves the Renaissance I believe um, everybody loves uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and everybody uh, kind of knows and has seen something. But why don't you look around? Why don't you look what happened? I don't know, 100 years before that, or 100 years late, later. Because you realize there are certain full gaps beyond this history. If you take I Italian history, is usually just uh, remember for uh, Roman history and the Renaissance. But what about all the rest? I mean, uh, I don't want to stress. Maybe now there are naturally many, many other countries in here, but that also did very interesting things. But you know, even 
and on the Schwerpunkt, I uh, incidentally made this um, medieval Italy playlist that is pretty hefty, but nobody watches. And I realized from that that either I don't think the people are not really interested. It's just I don't know that there is something like that to know. For instance, for me, the 14th century in Italian history is way, way more fascinating than the 15th. Uh, it was much more dynamic, much more varied, much more, uh, you know, uh, exciting in many ways. But people, how much do people know about the 14th century or the 13th century um, at that point? And this goes for so many other countries. How many people study the for instance, German history. How many people do really study the beginnings of the Habsburgs? For instance, the beginning of the Habsburgs. And also the Habsburgs suffer a bit of this because everybody remembers them just, you know, from the Renaissance onwards, um, from Maximilian um, and, and, and and the first and, and, and Charles V. Um, and then they kind of get stereotyped also in this modern age, both the Spanish and the, and the Austrian branch um, kind of, you know, also, this, I don't know why yeah, the Austria in the modern age passes from a kind of a weird thing and nobody nobody cares much about. Um, I own an, a pretty extensive um, English um, library, uh, almost 9,000 volumes at this point. Um, and I realize, if, if you look at the incidents of how much I Austrian history is discussed, it's so low. It's so damn low. I mean, and, and this also in, in German history. I mean, Italy at least gets something because of the Renaissance, in fact, in Roman history. But what about this gap? Even about France. I want to talk about a state so big like France that is um, very, very much stereotyped in, in the way it's, uh, it's narrated, in the complexity of its history. I mean, um, I must say, I, I'm, I, I'm a bit closer to medieval French history, so I appreciate certain things there but uh, the French have a, also a very peculiar relation with their history and uh, fortunately they produced enough about the French French history especially the, for the 13th century for um, there is so much to say but what about the, the development of the French mark even in later times how often do you read things about um, even the French war of religions in the early modern age are usually treated just as if they were, I don't know, just a matter of, of persons, just of individual choices. There is this idea, especially uh, when you study the confessional clashes, uh, also the orders that write about them, um, they tend to stress the ideological side of the story, like saying, you know, wars have always been fought for political interests and so on, but objectively these wars a moment where the... Uh, the mindset, the belief, the the conscience uh, brought to such side taking and so on. But yeah, okay. But what was the broader picture? What what can we say at a structural level? Why such things happened in the first place? Even think about uh, early 16th century Germany. Uh, that's a period, you know, with the uh, you know the the peasant, the great peasant revolt, with the, obviously the Reformation that, that permeated everything at this point. This Schmalkald League. Um, uh, how much has been really said about it, or about the? Uh, well, okay, maybe it's just my ignorance talking. I'm sure, uh, and I mean it's obvious that so much has been written. That my, the point I'm making here is how much this is absorbed by popular culture. How much is it really? interiorize in our identity uh, what these periods have been about and this is a question I, I make also because I believe that at a, certain, at, a at a certain point we will have to be able to narrate our own histories um, on the base of um, a, of a common view um, it's very bizarre also how in historiography, for instance, we um, there are still certain countries that have a positive view on certain topics. You know, we're talking about a European Union that is not just a um, practical necessity, but also a kind of a moral duty to do. And, and still we can't look at history jointly. 
I mean, think about the all the differences that are still felt between the Western and the Eastern world, or the Northern, uh, or excuse me, uh, Northern and, and Southern world. I mean, talking about Europe, it seems sometimes to go back in the 1930s to see, you know, the races and, and this kind of um, idea that there are inferior peoples, superior peoples, and 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 that and it's just a matter of who chooses the the biggest, who makes the biggest. Um, a refusal of of the values of democracy and so on. We, I, I think, we're profoundly mature, and I'm not talking now just like a European or a Westerner or a. Um, I'm really making a a worldwide point. And what worries me is that this happens simply because we haven't understood how history is important. You might say, you know, what's the formula you want to use to to cure the world. I think history is the uh, it's one of the best answers. I mean, I could tell you also medicine, I could tell you science broke the man, I could tell you so many other things. Um, even literature, philosophy, I mean, I think knowledge is definitely one thing. And history has the advantage of kind of enclosing this whole thing in a diachronic way. I mean, the idea that when you study history, you don't just study certain things, because history is the history of all the disciplines that ever existed, historically speaking. So, um, it's difficult to express, really, uh, the disappointment sometimes you have, and and if you wonder why I started the Schwerpunkt, it's partly because of this, it's, it's partly because of, um, <laughs> excuse me, I hope that through my videos I will, I will not, I, I don't want to teach anyone. I, I just want to offer perspectives and food for thought and just saying, look, uh, we, we we are part of such a complex reality that what's the point of even, you know, sticking to one point in, um, in terms of, you know, many people just learn things. I see it also for s certain colleagues that I've met uh, that finish their degree and they, they stop learning. Especially, I mean, I can understand when, I don't know, you, you want to be an engineer or a doctor and theoretically you still have to be updated and to know lots of things, but at least from a surely intellectual level, you, you don't have to go much deeper at that point. You just have to exercise also to be a pretty experienced uh, kind of uh, person and to, to, to acquire sheer practice also in how to, to perform your profession. But especially when you study history, you can't... I, I think it doesn't mean anything f to study history for three or five years and, and finishing your degree and saying, okay, now I I, I am a historian, I, I don't, I don't learn about history anymore, just I will read everything every once in a while. Because you realize many people have this kind of mindset. I just need a sheet of paper and to boast it in front of, I don't know, my friends, to feel accomplished, to, to find maybe a better job. This is for sure, there is this practical reason, there is nothing wrong with that. But how can you accompany this with stopping to learn? Stopping to learn. It, it's, it's, it's so wrong, in my opinion. Because you have come l l relatively that far, and you still haven't figured out that the way to better this world is to know ever more. So I'm, I'm not making a quest, I mean, for... Um, because you see, it's plenty of people out there that objectively can't learn. And most of the people can't learn. Also, one of the reasons, in fact, I chose YouTube is this one. To, to reach out to people who might be interested about something, making them discover so many other new things. I didn't start at Schwerpunkt to talk just about one topic. And the reason is, I want people to find out so many po topics that they even haven't even heard, simply because at school they haven't been thought about it, uh, or they uh, simply have never heard it for, for some reason, and saying, look what, what a wide world there is out there, and how useful this can be for me, for instance, to, to, to learn new things and to have new perspectives, to, to do something better with my life, to get to know things, because knowledge is so useful, it's really so useful, and it doesn't take actually much to, to know about it. I, I, there are there many people, um, there is a follower uh, I can't find now, that, uh, he told me something that really impressed me, that is that he listened to um, my videos when he's at, at, at work. Now, I don't know what work he does, so I hope this doesn't compromise his um, uh, 
his um, you know the quality of his job I, I don't think so but you know yeah you can these these are topics that everybody can you know come up here and listen to it's not that it takes studying it's just you know opening your mind in some ways and now I'm getting some some subscriber that I uh, really thank because you know I, I may I've put so many visa videos up there it's it's weird if I didn't have any sub subscriber but nevertheless you're just um, still a few relatively um, but um the uh, probably the most interesting thing about this is that I'm I'm collecting in fact many different type of people uh, among my subscribers so I have the hope that this means my topics are kind of for everyone of course, the more topics and the more varied uh, I, uh, the more varied topics I make, and the more videos I make, and the more people are gonna be come from from everywhere. But if that person knowing my videos, uh, you know, sees that there is else, well, maybe it's a good bait, <laughs> let's say, for um, you know, for making them figure out things they had not heard before. And I'm actually sometimes very disappointed to see that there are videos. Um, I like more, for instance, or I think that at least are more important and they say more interesting things. And many people watch those, that don't, excuse me, don't, do not watch those, and instead they watch unjustifiably so many, so much more um, about some other video. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I, I believe people shouldn't be guided, they should always um, have uh, um uh, let's say uh, there's always a good reason why someone spends his own free uh, here his or her own free time because it's not a matter of whether it's uh you know it depends what that person wants to do with his time um so i believe in kind of individual freedom and i appreciate every taste every uh interest as long as it's not harmful for for someone of course but um it's um, at the same time, I wonder why certain topics simply do not interest. Uh, and it's difficult to answer. So, mm, all this because I started talking about the Renaissance and I thought about how many prejudices were still living from that age. Um, I could add more, but I think it's unnecessary. I have made this kind of useless digression at the end, but uh, maybe it adds a little bit up of, you know, certain this reflections kind of interesting. Power. For now, I cut it off. So, um, just I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.